Welcome to uh, the Citrus Research Exchange. Um, uh, I'm uh, Carl Blumstein. I am the director of the Citrus Sustainable Infrastructures Initiative. Um, and uh, I'm uh, glad to welcome uh, Florian Michaelis. Um, did I get it right, Florian? <laughs> uh, who was our, uh, our speaker? He has been heading the Siemens Web of Things Research Group since 2013. He's worked in the fields of ubiquitous and wearable computing for more than a decade. Florian's focus at Siemens is to leverage the web architecture and semantic technologies for enabling new business opportunities, especially in the field of wearable sensing and human robot interactions. Please welcome Florian. Yeah, hello everybody. Thank you very much um, for the introduction. And um, for you, Carl, but also for everybody else who has some difficulty with my last name, um, it's actually quite easy to remember. So whenever you would go to Germany and you would say my last name, you actually can use it for ordering a beer. So if you, s if you actually sit down in a restaurant and you say, für mich a helles, this is basically a light beer you would get. So um, <laughs> just to, to make some sense of this rather long last name. So. Um, it's my pleasure to be here now and to um, talk about uh, Web of Systems, um, the, let's say, the Siemens interpretation of the Internet of Things. So um, I'm very happy to be here. I have been here many times in the audience, so it's a great pleasure uh, to have the opportunity to talk to you. So um, maybe first of all, why are we here? So we are a small research uh, team um, of Siemens. We are um, 10 people actually sharing the office uh, with Carl Blumstein. Um, as, um, as tenants. And um, the reason why we actually got located here is about combining two different worlds. So this is the world of, of manufacturing where Siemens is uh, traditionally in. And uh, we located in the Bay Area in the Silicon Valley and want a bridge between these two worlds. So why is that interesting? So um, terming that maybe the Black Forest engineering is about um, building reliable, robust machines that last for long times. So this, is a, this is an industrial motor which can be built in, in, a, in a ship or in an, um, in, uh, used as an industrial drive. And this is really about building long-living um, components and um, having a rather centralized approach of developing here, having deterministic outcomes of that and um, having, having this world. And now uh, we're interested in blending that uh, together with the creativity we actually experience here, together with startups, together with universities, to um, think about how can we get these machines, actually get them connected, get them database, get them um, more probabilistic, and blending these two worlds um, into each other. And um, this is what um, uh, we call the web of systems. So using web technologies to making these systems smarter. And there's actually um, three levels we see for enabling that. And the reason for doing that is um, as we see um, new opportunities for um, products and services here. And now the, the motor you've seen before, a first step is just to get that connected, um, to give it an IP address and get that connected. And then having sensors that are built in this motor, um, having these sensors accessible from, from outside and uh, doing analytics uh, with that, doing process um, optimization and streaming the data from this motor um, into the cloud and um, optimizing, let's say, the um, rotation of a wind turbine, uh, finding up out about how the blade should be oriented based on data. Now, um, the next step, and this is, this is, this is happening, and the next step what we're interested in is, is, like, is like this, the middle and the, and the right-hand side, is about um, getting the devices smart themselves. So instead of just streaming the data from here to here, the question is, what kind of knowledge do we already have locally and can incorporate, and instead of uh, just streaming the raw sensor data and having a, a, a series of timestamp values, thinking about how could that be already processed to some, to some, um, to some piece of information um, based on the knowledge which is, which is, um, which is um, available here. So to, do, um, to have a web-enabled device that can provide local automation analytics and other services 
um, rather than just the raw data that's coming out of the sensors. And um, the third step here is um, about having interactive devices that are not just talking to a central cloud, but also can resolve problems um, and can interact with each other. So if we have the motor I just had before, if that's uh, connected to a variety of other sensors, let's say to, um, to a clock, uh, to a flow sensor and to a pressure sensor, and suddenly the, the flow in the tube actually gets clocked, the motor and the clock sensor actually can, can negotiate and could say, well, there's probably something clocked. We have to increase the pressure in order to keep the flow going. So this is something which could also be resolved locally rather than um, involving a cloud and being dependent on, on latency and communication and connectivity there. So the question really is about um, to what extent can we leverage the cloud and also the local reasoning and the local knowledge which is um, available at the source. And um, all that is, um, is actually also happening through, um, through apps or components, algorithms, which could be also loaded onto these um, devices after they have been deployed. So probably not quite like the App Store um, uh, of the iPhone, but similar to that, that we have a mechanism that um, allows to also deploy algorithms and um, updated versions um, later on. Now, um, the Web of Systems also allows now the data processing automation anywhere upon user's discretion. So, so this is what I said, that um, uh, factory owners are not necessarily interested in getting all their data they collect in their factory to some cloud, which is hosted by someone, but they rather want to be in control and want to decide <coughs> which parts of data probably should go into the cloud and which part of the data um, should also be processed um, locally. So having the... the um, this stack here of smart device automation services, data information and knowledge, um, having that in under control and having the decision about is that something which could even be resolved, let's say, um, on the motor directly or on some gateway, or would it really have to go in the, into the cloud? So the, um, the promise of, of this approach here is um, to have a system that allows to keep control of the data and the processing. Now, um, what I just mentioned um, at the example of the motor um, actually should be, uh, should, be, uh, should be used across all the different uh, business fields that uh, Siemens is in. So ranging from, from wind power, power and gas, mobility, trains, uh, building technology management of uh, commercial buildings, healthcare, uh, then uh, process indu industries and drives, uh, factory automation, and um, smart grid. So. Um, one thing is to um, make the components, the devices um, that are involved in here smarter themselves and have them communicating within the factory. Um, but then also thinking about how can we bring these different domains together. So if a factory is uh, controlling um, the, um, the manufacturing process and um, the smart grid is um, balancing the power in the grid and is about um, uh, also enabling demand uh, response. The question then uh, would come into play, so how could the grid also talk to the factory and ask the factory maybe to, to think about to save some energy at that moment, and instead of allowing the grid operator to really dig deep into the factory and looking at which machines are available, um, it would be desired that the factory control system could come up uh, with, um, with a proposal about how to save energy based on the insights it has into the machines that really are, are available here. So that means we have terminology and we have commands <coughs> coming from a smart grid world and completely different um, terms and um, languages which are being used in another domain like, like in the factory control. How can we um, connect these to each other, at least on an, on an abstract level, such that we also can um, run applications which are, which are going across these domains which are traditionally disconnected. So um, the Internet of Things um, would allow to, to think about new applications which would also go across uh, these different domains here. Now that actually means um, that uh, we have to find ways to let devices uh, speak the same language. So the same language within specific domains, which means then also um, within the domain and across manufacturers of different devices, but as I mentioned in my last example, also across different domains. 
And um, how to do that is, um, is actually that um, the idea is that um, analytics know-how, uh, context know-how and domain know-how, which is available about um, um, experiences of how to run a factory, about how to um, control a grid, which is basically laid down today in, in standards and procedures that, that people follow in, 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 written, manu in, in, in written manuals, um, how could that be made um, machine accessible so that um, machines and um, algorithms can actually build upon uh, the knowledge uh, that um, has been developed in these different domains. And um, we see it as, as our mission to, um, to apply um, semantics and ontologies that would help to describe the terms and describe the vocabulary in a machine-readable way such that can be used uh, for uh, improving the analytics um, by improving this knowledge which is, which is available here. So um, I think I talked a little bit now about the vision, about the, the ideas in the abstract, and um, I would like to, to give you some insights now about what we are working on in the lab, and then later on also show you some examples about how this has um, started also to, to getting uh, deployed. So as I mentioned, the, the goal is to think about how can we let devices um, interact with, which, uh, with each other so that we have um, autonomous devices that we can negotiate and coordinate um, uh, processes and um, that we see semantic technologies as a cornerstone to do that and functional profiles that describe what these different machines actually can do and build that upon the existing industrial standards so not to not to reinvent the wheel but rather the, the terminology that a process designer is using when um, a workplace is being designed but um, translating these standards into semantics such that machines actually can read these standards. So it's, um, it's another form of, of language uh, that we are um, um, uh, developing here. <coughs> so what I'm showing in this video here is that traditionally manufacturing is built for high volume production and what we believe now with um, semantic technologies, what we can do is we can uh, make production uh, more flexible. So what we have, we have a description about this is a conveyor belt, it can carry stuff, this is a robot, it can move stuff, uh, we might have other machines that can drill holes, that can do this, and now by um, describing the goal, what we want to do, we can reason about what's available and we can, we can do that. Now when this resource becomes unavailable, the system can find an alternative route, but this is a robot, maybe slower than this one, uh, but still can achieve the task. So this gives us more flexibility in, um, in um, um, allowing control. And we can do that with conventional equipment and also with new devices that are coming in. And this is a quick uh, view now at the demo setup we have in our lab. So a little toy robot representing the conventional system, um, a ROS a robot um, representing um, the um, uh, newer devices. And now what we have here, we have the setup of a few machines here, um, two robots that have a certain reach controlled by, by a Siemens control here. This robot can reach the heater. Um, this robot can reach the fan, but not the heater. And now we have a production goal that uh, actually can use the descriptions of these different devices. And the, the um, production goal is getting loaded here. So what we say is we want to finish a box. And finishing a box means it has to be dried, it has to be heated up. And now the system is finding out how can we reach these machines in order to achieve that goal. So by using the semantics of this machine and this machine and this machine, this one is going to the heater now. So the heater is getting, getting activated now. Um, uh, the, the robot is now um, trying to reach the fan, which it cannot, so it's handing over to this robot. And now this robot can finish the task by, um, by uh, reaching the fan and uh, drying up uh, the object. So um, this, is a, this is a very um, a simple setup, but the idea behind that is that we, we do not sequentially program the different machines, we only describe their capabilities and then we have a logical reasoning about how these machines have to be used in order to achieve that goal. So what it has been shown in this video is that we use semantic technologies to describe the capabilities of these machines and by that uh, we enable um, an alternative flow of, um, of how the production can be achieved. 
We increase the flexibility and can also integrate the uh, conventional devices which are run on, on current um, controllers. We are currently also working on extending these descriptions um, from machines to people so that we also could have roles of operators that have um, certain capabilities and could also be involved into this manufacturing planning by providing a goal, looking at which resources are available and then de deriving the plan about how that actually could be produced. So um, the underlying work of that is um, what we call the Web of Systems Semantic Framework, which is um, built um, upon uh, ontologies where we can now plug in what we call different knowledge packs for the different domains. So what we've just seen the demo uh, was a representation for automation where we would um, describe um, the movements of a robot, the operations of, um, of heating and drying uh, and building up that on um, existing vocabulary. And similar things are currently in the works for, for Smart Grid. And um, by that, we are kind of imagining of building up a library of, um, of, of conventions, a library of um, relationships and terms that could be used in the various domains in order to, um, to make the uh, procedures there more flexible and um, allow reasoners to um, derive an outcome for a, a given goal. Um, this is, this is just the, the, the demo basic you have seen. So at the moment, uh, the demo we have shown is, is running on a, on a mobile phone, but of course it could be running on uh, in the cloud if desired or also on, on another device. And the idea is that we have the descriptions of the different machines, the different components that are available, and based on the reasoning, they are um, combined in order to um, produce um, that goal. And um, if you're interested, uh, I put the link down there. There are also more details in a paper which we just um, published recently. Now, um, as I said, um, what I provided was an example from the lab. So um, this, is, this is probably already closer to reality from the field of smart grid, where uh, we have an intelligent uh, secondary substation, uh, which is um, actually managing um, the grid here. And this substation is um, instrumented with some sensors which allows to also locally control the, the, the voltage and um, by using these attached sensors here. Um, in addition, we also have um, the, the notion of apps. So this substation could be after deployment also be instrumented with, with newer algorithms, which is about like balancing, for example, here v voltages. Um, and that it has the, the notion that there's a notion of an app store where applications can be downloaded um, onto this um, substation. And um, it should also allow then to cross domain integration, what I mentioned before, that this substation could then be also um, integrated um, with buildings. So then buildings are um, in demand of energy that they could negotiate with the substation about um, what's, uh, what's available. Um, so the setup is this, that there is um, a data processing and availab availability of the data in, in, the, in the cloud here, that we have a number of field services here. Web technology is being used to um, monitor on and control that. And um, all the data is, uh, is available on a dashboard, which allows um, uh, to look at the data and then also to take action and um, control. So um, now so some research still going on in that is, um, I think similar to work I've seen last week at the, at the Bears e event um, in, in David's group about um, smart buildings, where it was about how to annotate um, a data which is available. The same thing is happening here in the grid. So there is a lot of data which has been codified which with, with numbers about that this is indicating a certain meter uh, with a certain value. And over time, it's really be, uh, becoming hard to make sense out of this really non-speaking tags. And at the moment, it's a manual task where um, an engineer would sit down and would match this number to hopefully something more meaningful, which could say, okay, this, this is data from, from a smart meter. And by having this tax, then also some um, analytics um, could be made and this data can be used because otherwise it's just a lot of values, which is really hard to um, relate to where they're coming from. Now, um, what we tried um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a research project is that how could we actually learn these parameters by looking at the values and automatically annotate the stream? 
and um, we would we, we would we would look at the at the spread of the data and have an ontology which is um, a collection of um, of relationships and talking about um, which values are available and which values are most likely to happen at, at certain locations and with that we could um, automatically annotate the data rather than having um, a person sitting there and doing this um, tedious job. And um, what we're currently re relying upon is that there is a number of existing ontologies which are the more generic ones so uh, QDDT is something that has been uh, developed at, at NASA which is about um, quantities and units so this is, this is about voltages and amperes and, and, and so on so to get the units uh, straight. Then um, this is an established ontology which is talking about uh, what is a sensor, what is a measurement, having the operating range and the, and the survival range of sensors. And um, then actually we also had to build our own ontology which um, is about the, um, about the actual smart grid domain. And the idea is always to um, hopefully connect to as many as um, ontologies that are already available and combine that in order to uh, make sense out of these uh, relationships and use that in this case for the automatic annotation um, of the data. So um, this has been implemented by some colleagues in Austria. This is, um, this is the, um, the secondary substation uh, with a web interface and storage and a control application. Um, it's connecting through an interface to the actual sensors and then the um, actual um, matching and annotation of the data um, is, is being made there. Now, um, the video is already starting. Uh, I want to give you also a little glimpse at the, um, at the interface, that's uh, at the dashboard, which is available here. So what you see here is basically um, a map of um, a part of, of Vienna. And we see the green points are substations, which are currently operating in a, in a, in, in a good condition. And what we also see here is these are basically the algorithms or the, we could say, the apps which are installed on this, on, on this node here. We can see some data about the CPU and the RAM to see some health data about how these um, substations are performing at the moment. And now what's done in the simulation, a problem is created so um, that this, this um, substation is turning red now. And um, there's a warning that there's a voltage uh, band violation happening here. And now uh, there is a recommendation coming about which algorithms are available in the App Store which could be installed in order to, to mitigate this problem. So um, again, we have a semantic description of the problem and a semantic description about the capabilities of these apps here. And then um, the, the variety of apps that could help to solve this problem are suggested and an operator can then use this um, and can install it. So you might ask, why isn't that done automatically? Uh, well, this is, this is just part of the work procedures that um, for, for, for regulation issues, it's still required that, that people would, would do the job. But at a later stage, we could also think about um, uh, fully automating that. So um, what this interface actually does, so it, it hides the details of protocol addressing for, uh, from the users. It, um, it um, allows to add um, human and machine readable semantics to data so that we really have some, some sense making of this problem and the, and the applications which are being suggested here. And um, we have a way of, um, of yeah, installing apps and describing apps um, that um, are relevant for the actual case rather than uh, looking at, a, at the full spectrum of available apps in the App Store. So with that, um, I'm already coming um, closer to the end of my talk, so I, I want to uh, finish with some open questions uh, which we think are, are interesting and we are also um, excited to work together with, with partners um, from, from UC Berkeley here. So um, the general challenge, what I was describing, is really about um, how do we describe things how do we describe the needs, characteristics, and service offerings? Whether it's in manufacturing, whether it's in smart grid, whether it's in buildings, it's about um, like the robots. It's rather simple. It's like the geometric, maybe the geometric range of the robot. Um, how can we describe that? That this can be used in combination with uh, with other machines and can be used to establish collaboration. Then, um, of course, also, also how do we balance between performance and reliability and security? So with a robot, for example, we have to always make sure that even if this is a, a path now to solve that, that um, we don't hit 
a worker who is um, around that machine. So there's additional boundary conditions, which of course would also then um, go back to the, to the performance. So it's about balancing um, here. Uh, then what I mentioned, uh, we are really interested in integrating existing experience. So instead of coming up with new terminology and um, new rules, what we want to do is we want to build upon established standards. So these are just some standards uh, which are already used in industry today. So these are, this is a description language where in the chemical industries, companies describe um, what their sensors actually are required to measure, what the accuracy is, um, what their behavior is. And this is basically standards written manuals for people. And what we want to do is we want to take these standards which are already there and already used and describe the, the state of the art and make them machine readable by, by actually building these libraries of knowledge using, using semantics and then um, using web technologies to, to also um, communicate and collaborate uh, across devices. And finally, um, I think I also, also mentioned that um, I was talking a lot about what can we do on the device but ultimately it's really about how do we leverage smart data and big data. So um, our understanding is currently is that um, probably decisions, if possible, are made best on the device because it's just much faster and there's more, more local knowledge uh, available. However, uh, the rules which describe um, how the decision should be made on the device, that's something that probably could get learned over time much better in the cloud based on, based on statistics and based on data. And once rules actually can be derived, they could get pushed down um, onto the devices and could be executed there. So um, then allowing also to move runtime procedures between cloud and edge. So developing a rule and then uh, moving it down to the device. Yeah, with that, um, I'm at the end of my talk. So. Um, we are in Berkeley, so we are really interested in um, collaborating um, with, with you. We also have um, a class currently at, at iSchool where we get some exposure to, to students. We're really happy to be together with uh, CIE at the moment. And um, we are really happy to be here and see a lot of, lot of touch points and good input to bridge these two worlds, as I mentioned them um, before, and use it as a new opportunity for um, developing new products and services. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? <laughs> How do you define smart data? Oh, so what, is, what is smart data? Yeah, okay, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a really um, fine definition, but basically you could say it's, it's information. It's like not a timestamp value. It's if you have a temperature value and you know that if the temperature value is going above a certain threshold, that it becomes dangerous, you could call it, instead of just temperature, you could call it dangerous now. And this is something more meaningful than just the temperature value. So it's, it's something which is a bit of information for a specific context. Assuming that it's dynamic in some way, that it's, that it's not a single value, but it changes? Yeah, yeah. Let's say it's, it's a state of a machine. Instead of just having the, the sensor reading, it's a state of a machine. So, so you're referring to the to the um, to the substation, uh, or you had a system to do with wind power and all oh yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, that, that view you're referring to, this, this is more like the different business fields that Siemens is in. And Siemens is, is not in battery storage. But from a systems view, um, you're certainly right that this has to be incorporated, um, but then probably just being bought or used for, from someone else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm 
That's right. I think so, but I, I don't know. I have a really clear answer to that. So, so the, the environment is, as you say, something open, which uh, we are not really about modeling the world, which a little bit sounds like that we would have to if you really want to incorporate what you're saying. So take manufacturing, it's a very closed world. Of course, of course, a lot of things could happen outside. If, um, if, a, if a, a nuclear power plant is exploding, um, probably it's not part of the, of the model for the factory. But um, thinking about what's happening in the surrounding probably could be really big. So I think in the end, it's really a decision about um, what, is, what is being used um, and what is, what is necessary to model. So we, in, we don't want to model the world. We only want to model the parts which are necessary to improve the system. And um, if there is a case for the submarine you're mentioning to, to model the environment, maybe it will be done. But I think there's o it's a, there's a trade-off. Yeah. Okay, yeah, G good question. So um, I think you probably, we, we do not, we, we, we are not, we're not in lack of languages. We are lack of, we're probably lacking um, adoption of a specific language and that just has never happened. So I think there have been many research projects which were proposing, let's say, automate ML, um, different languages, which um, Actually, we're always trying to, to come up with something new. And what we want to do is we want to we wanna take the existing terms and just make them machine readable. And um, we are also not interested in advancing or developing a new OWL language. It, we just have the feeling this is something which is left over from the semantic web. Uh, there are people that know how to use it. There are tools available. So let's just use that and um, follow what the majority is doing, um, web technologies, and build upon that rather than developing yet something different. But adapt that and um, do the hard work in um, doing the manual work of, of representing the above standards in this, in this model. Yeah. But the second line, how to actually use, agree on this. Right? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So for large and complex systems that you see in uh, everyday environments, in this space there would be devices that are made by humans and devices that are made by other companies. Uh, do you anticipate any challenges in, in getting other companies to adopt the protocol that you say that you can make really large? Yeah. Yeah. So that is a challenge, but the good news, it also has been at least in some parts solved. So like like this one here, EDDL is a standard that was basically um, or, or E class that was actually um, developed by companies like BASF who need certain sensors in their in their chemical plants, and they want to be independent from being depend from from one single vendor. 
And instead of just going through all the specs from Siemens and all the others, um, what they say, okay, this is, this is our terminology. So this is how we describe what the sensor should do for our plant. And then it's the job for all the companies to translate their features into that language. So, so um, at least for certain parts, this has been done. And the idea is now that this is still something manual. This, this is still something which um, is a guideline a programmer could use to write a software and then to make it compliant with the standard. And we actually want to represent that in, in, in a, in a model-based approach so that the standard is not a PDF document, but it's actually an OWL model. And if the standard changes, um, all, the, all the applications that are using the standards and refer to that model would be compliant again. And that's the approach. So in that, in that, in that sense, we can shortcut a little bit since, since work has been done instead of, um, like what you said, um, developing a new language which probably would be hard to find um, acceptance and adoption for. Yes? Yeah, there would be certainly applications for that. So that yeah, yeah, yeah. So at, at the moment, I would say it's it's more it's more at the foundation what I presented, but uh, of course this would be a nice application what you're saying, and then specifically allowing to um, to really drill down to a certain machine, which probably the factory would not like to expose to PG&E, but having an interface which which uh, which would allow to shield it off and would allow to negotiate that. The factory is saying, I can save energy, I don't tell you how, but I will figure it out internally. Uh, this is what, what we see would be possible here. Any other questions? Okay, uh, then uh, thank you very much, and it uh, was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you.